Hey everybody, welcome to Under the Mango Tree. I'm going to be hosting a very exciting discussion. We're talking pop culture, both Star Wars and Back to the Future. And we've got with us two of Mango's favorite authors. We got Brad Gilmar, author of the book Back from the Future, and Kim Na Ken Knapsack, author of Why We Love Star Wars. And we're going to be talking about both of them, two of my favorite sub subjects. Thank you both for uh, for being here. This is great. Oh, absolutely fun. Anytime I can uh, see Brad uh, on, on my camera screen is a win for me and all of them. And every time I see Ken, I just get more and more jealous of the beard game that he has going on. You see my little Shakespearean scruff compared to his <laughs> man manhood over there. Yeah, I like this. It's like, like the three stages of beard between the three of us. <laughs> I, I can only dream to be where Ken is as well. I feel like I'm about halfway, but I still got a ways to go. You just gotta you go, get, you're beating me, Sean. <laughs> you just got to get older and grumpier. You'll be all right. <laughs> so you, you guys both, both both know each other, obviously, have, have worked together um, in the past as well? Yeah, yeah. We met through something called the movie Trivia Schmodown, uh, where Brad announces and I do some announcing. I used to compete in, in the Star Wars stuff. But then we have uh, kind of a shared interest and background uh, in professional wrestling. I, I worked in it on and off for 20 years, and Brad's still uh, absolutely just uh, killing it uh, with, with Booker T and everything going on over there in Houston. So we kind of bonded over that, I think. <laughs> we actually just uh, recently shared the stage together in Brooklyn, New York. You know, did a little, did a little hosting out there together. So, yeah, we, we're familiar. I know this man. Yeah, and uh, wrestling. I, I want to do a whole nother one of these where the three of us can just talk wrestling because I, I also have that shared love. So, but let's let let's talk about Star Wars and Back to the Future. So, just to start off, what first attracted you to to to, to your fandom? What was kind of your first entry point where it wasn't just like like past that point of like like I really am into this. This is something that that I'm like I, I really want to want to think about and spend spend some some time with. For me, uh, seeing Return of the Jedi in the theaters at seven was the starting point, though I, I had been around for New Hope, a uh, little tiny baby when that happened. But I think it was a couple years later when the movies were still with me, the stories were still with me, the lessons, whether I completely realized I was learning them, were still with me. When that kind of thing moves past childhood, and we also were in an era where you were supposed to leave that stuff behind, and then you suddenly look around and realize, I can take some of it with me. I can take it into adulthood, which is kind of what George intended anyways with these uh and that's kind of when i for me uh, early junior high high school and i'm like oh no i still i still love this thing and I, i'm gonna keep it with keep it keep it right here with me yeah i think i'm the same as ken it was actually seven when i discovered back to the future it was on the disney channel of all places i saw it in a, like a back-to-back -back marathon and had to go to blockbuster right after and rent them on vhs um they just stayed with me for as long as you know i can remember and it was really though i think when i kind of got into middle school or high school like ken said where I started to realize not only do I talk about these movies all the time, I, I, I watch everything that I can find on them. I'll buy the extended DVDs, watch all the behind the scenes stuff, try to learn about you know the story of it. And then for me, Back to the Future was so generational. My folks, my dad was born in 45, my mom in 54, my grandparents in the teens and 20s, my brother in the 60s, my other brother in the 70s, 80s. So it just like it was such a generational film for me that it made me almost feel connected to my family in a different way because I kind of got to see what the world was like through their lens, at least at the time. You know, that was another reason that it just stuck with me. And then for, for Michael J. Fox, who battled Parkinson's disease, continues to battle Parkinson's, my grandmother succumbed to Parkinson's disease in 2016. It was just something that always just kept me tied into the franchise. Yeah, and I think I actually have almost the, the same experience as bo both of you. Like that same seven-year-old, I remember going to the movies with my aunt to see Return of the Jedi. Exactly the same thing. So, so Ken, I, I think I don't have an excuse on the beard. I, th I think we may be pretty close to the same age. Uh, yeah, but I was, I was out, out to Return of the Jedi and that just, it just blows you away. Like it was all we did on the playground. All we did was play Star Wars. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that pops up a lot in my book. And also when I discuss Star Wars on shows and everything is is taking it to the playground. And that's the power of the toys that you have uh, the hero, your hero in your hand and then di dividing up the roles on the playground. Today, you're Han Solo. Today, you're Luke, you're Leia, you're Lando. And then reenacting almost to beat by beat what we saw in the movie that that kind of fostered the love and kept helped it grow. Yeah, absolutely. And what 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 is the the one thing? Because obviously, but both of your books are really tying into the fandom, giving a, a behind the scenes a little bit, and discussing why we love these. And in house, we almost describe this whole thing as the why we love series. 
In- including the the James Bond Brad that uh, is coming out next year to give a bit of a plug to that one too. Um, we'll have a James Bond book coming out that I'm very excited about as well. What 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 is the one thing that that you hope that that your fans get out out of these books um, when 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 they pick them up and and, and read them? Oh. When I read Ken's book, and I think it was just so aptly titled, it, it, it really came across as a complete love for a franchise. It was love for movies, love for the universe that Lucas created back in 77 or whatever. And when I was starting to write mine, I wanted to go a- along the same lines. And that's why the subtitle is A Celebration of the Greatest Time Travel Story Ever Told. It's not meant to be the, this critical analysis. It's not meant to be, well, here's what they did wrong, or here's what they could have done better, or I hated that they did this in the movie. It was really just, I love these films. I want to tell you why I love them. I want to tell you my thoughts about them. I want to tell you what I think the best parts of them are. And so when I think that I want someone to read my book, the big takeaway is, why these movies have connected to people for as many years as they have. Not so much. The behind the scenes is great. I mean, we touch on that. You have to have that in a book, especially if somebody's a layman picking up a Back to the Future book. You want to give them some, some, uh, something to work with up top. But I want people to walk away with, oh, wow, I see the connection. I see why he connected with it. I see why other people connected with it. I'm going to give these movies another run. And really, if I can sell more copies of Back to the Future after people read back from the future like job well done along with brad there it's this idea of of if we truly love it and truly love these things and there's other movies that i like or other properties i enjoy but i connect with star wars on a very emotional level as well as a critical thinking level but like brad this wasn't a this wasn't a a breakdown a a takedown of anything i didn't like i always want to choose to celebrate what's there for me that i love and and what i I love in all the star wars stories because that's what it means to me you know a lot of times we're brought on shows and i'm sure brad gets this too of uh, back to the future expert or star wars expert i don't consider that true i consider myself a student of star wars I'm still learning at it, and I'm still learning what what's there for me. I always talk about uh, I have a unique journey as a Star Wars fan, but it's a shared unique journey. We all have it, and me, even as a middle-aged white dude with a gray beard, I, I, I bet I have some kind of love that connects to a lot of different people, and Star Wars is about generations. It is about uh, opening up the story to everyone, and Star Wars has uh, continued to do a better job of that over the years. So we all have this different point of view, different perspective. That's this shared journey through Star Wars, and I, I hope that's what people can gather from the book. I think that's actually a really great point that Ken brings up about Star Wars, the fact that they have now X amount more films than they did even before, you know, because your book came out in what, 19, Ken? 2019, yes. Yeah, so 19. Yeah. Yeah. So we've had, you know, some more Star Wars to love on since his, the release of his book, and it's just brought so many more people in, you know, bringing Ray as the main protagonist of the sequel trilogy opens up a whole nother wave of Star Wars fans. Little girls now can say, oh, I can be a Jedi too, or even having Finn involved or Poe Dameron. It really expands the universe. I think Back to the Future, we still get to expand the universe and, and create new or, and get new fans from the perspective of it's already a generational piece. It's already about relationships between mothers and fathers and friends, and, and, it, and it's an adventure story. And everybody, at some point in your lifetime, thinks if I had a time machine, where would I go? <laughs> what would I do? Would I go back to third grade and ask Cecily Roberts out to the Enchantment Under the Sea dance? Would I you know, go forward in time to see what my life is? Everyone thinks of that. It's a universal idea that everyone connects with. And I think that's really what Ken does. A, Ken does a great job in his book really explaining, again, the love for it and why people connect to it, why he connects to it. And I think him saying a unique shared journey is such an apropos term for Star Wars as well as Back to the Future or James Bond or whatever else you know, you're a fan of. Everyone has like the same, you, as we just all learned, we we're all seven when we found these, yeah. you know, these films that we loved. It's just kind of that individual shared uh, uh, journey. And I appreciate uh, Brad putting me over there and back at him here. He's taking a movie that's you know, Back to the Future in a series that's so uber popular and so just this event movie of time. Like, I remember the night my mom and aunt came back from the movie theater and talked about it and this glory and all these things I didn't fully understand. I saw it a, a little bit later after them. Uh, but Brad has taken uh, what that movie is, this big event movie, and, 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 and broken it down to look at how it connects to us uh, on a family level, a friend level, uh, choices, the choices you make when you're challenged, the whole chicken thing and, and, and overcoming anger and vengeance and all those kinds of things. It's, it's so layered in that movie, but wrapped up into this perfect script. I still think it's one of the perfect movies of our time. And you could stop there as a film fan, but Brad takes it uh, down 
to a personal level as well. There's really something in both of them as well, where like when we're talking about this, this kind of like unique personal journeys, but we all share this unique personal journey. Um, there, there are all these, these weird little bits that you can kind of hang on to that kind of become yours where like, I'm, I'm a huge fan of wedge and like, it's all about wedge and back to the future. It's like, I was like a 12 year old with like a penguins album. So I, I could l- listen to like earth angel, right? You get those weird little bits that like soak into your life in other ways. Like I've met people who legitimately like the B Arthur character from the Christmas special. Right. And like, like hang on onto that character and like that song, which is way too long. Let's be honest. It's fun. It's fun for a minute. And then it's like another four minutes. Uh, but, uh, do, do you guys have those, those, those little bits that you kind of feel like are yours from the movie that are kind of those, those little weird moments or whatever that you've kind of really grabbed onto our characters maybe. Yeah. There's a lot in Star Wars uh, that are the, the grizzled weirdos is one of my favorite things for making the jokes about my beer, but I love kind of uh, like Quill from uh, Mandalorian. Uh, you mentioned Wedge. I'm a big Wedge fan. I wrote about Wedge because one of my little favorite things is in, in Return of the Jedi when Wedge gets to say Lock S foils into attack position. And I'm like, he got he got promoted. He didn't just survive. <laughs> he got promoted. And I love little things like that and background lines. One of my favorites in Return of the Jedi is when 3PS emerges uh, in front of the Ewoks and they're all bound down to him. And one of the Ewoks in very plain basic says, that guy's wise. It's just the weirdest, <laughs> silly, stupidest thing. But it's like, what? of my favorite things and and i thought i was the only one that saw it at seven right like i'm the only one and then you then you find a friend 10 years later who's like you know what i love when that ewok says that guy's wise and you're like suddenly like that's our thing that's our thing so yeah that those are some for me i, I mean i have especially you know characters there's a lot of like fun side characters in back to the future i actually do a chapter in the book called the almanac where i where i talk about like my favorite little things from the movie and one of the lists i do is like the top 10 background characters from from Back to the Future, kind of side characters outside of Marty, Biff, Doc, Lorraine, and George. I love old man Peabody, who's the farmer on Twin Pines mm-hmm. Ranch. Uh, then it becomes a Lone Pine Mall later in the future. I love, obviously, how could you watch Back to the Future and not remember Mayor? I could run <laughs> for Mayor, right? Goldie Wilson is classic. But as far as like the thing that I always mention, whenever I get to talk to any people from the cast and we talk about the movies and I say, look, this is my favorite line from the movie. It's not when this baby hits 88. It's not heavy. It's not great Scott. It's when they're in 1955. Marty just wakes up in Lorraine's bed. They go down to the family dinner and uh, she like grabs him by the thigh and he gets freaked out and he runs out. And Lorraine's dad goes, he's an idiot. It comes from upbringing. His parents are probably idiots, too. You know, Lorraine, if you ever have a child like that, I'll disown you. But that he's an idiot. It comes from upbringing. I've used it so many times in wrestling commentary, on the radio, <laughs> in podcasts, in papers that I wrote <laughs> in grad school. Like I've used "You're an idiot." It comes from upbringing so many times. It's, it, it, it is cool how how much we we connect with these. And I always think about this when uh, when folks are like when kids are coming to this. I used to teach high school, and and I talk to kids who hadn't seen these movies yet because you know they're they're like 13. So they hadn't been part of their lives yet. And I'm kind of excited for them of like, oh, you're going to get to see this and have, have this experience. And when, when, when there's people that, that you talk to that haven't seen these are going, to get a, are going to see them for the first time, what is it that you kind of hope that they're going to get out of that? Like for someone new to Star Wars or Back to the Future, what is, what is kind of the main thing that you would hope that they, that, that, that they take away from, from that first viewing? I got to watch Back to the Future with my nephews who are um, now they're 12 and 10, but at the time they were like, I don't know, 10 and eight or something like that. And I was like, Hey, I'm going to show you like the greatest movie ever. Well, we put on back to the future and what they got out of it at the end was the reaction that I wanted. When doc comes back at the end and they're in the driveway and says, well, we're going, we don't need roads. And the DeLorean flies into the screen. My nephew Parker turns to me, he goes, there's another one. And that was the reaction that I wanted. I said, yes, there is. Let's put it back to the future too. At the end of back to the future too, when he figured out there's back to the future three, he was sold. You know, these kids are on YouTube at a very early age. He's starting to find all the little behind the scenes. He's like, did you know there was a guy who was originally going to be Marty McFly? I'm like, yeah, I wrote it in the book, kid, read my book. But that was a reaction that I wanted. Yeah. When you see back to the future the first time, you're so enthralled by the story. As Ken said, it's such a perfect script. It's self-contained. If it ended there, it would be fine. It'd be still one of the greatest movies ever made. 
But then when you realize, wait a minute, there's two more of these? Let's go. <laughs> like, that's the reaction that I wanted. And my nephew hit it out of the park for me. This thought going into it, and that I mentioned how each three of those movies moves you, affects you, and guides you as a fan, because that's when these kind of things get into your life and get into your heart. They do guide you. These are kind of like going to their own little church. All due respect to church. But uh, learning from Marty McFly's failures and his successes, learning from Luke Skywalker's failures and his successes, I think that's what keeps bringing people back. Uh, and that also has to do with the generational change and how everyone starts to interact with Star Wars and Back to the Future differently. It is that love that's put in it too, because that, that, you know, Jack Dexter's Diner, it's this little American graffiti yeah. hidden in Star Wars that's kind of his, his, his little stamp on it. It's interesting, Brad, you saying the three trilogies having the different style. Star Wars fans, like, there is a bit of pushback, and I think more people are grabbing that, but that's, that's Star Trek in a nutshell. Like, Star Trek original versus TNG versus Deep Space Nine. It's, it's the same thing, totally different world each time, totally different style. Are, are there other fandoms that, that you're like as, even close to as passionate about? Because Brad, I, I know you've got, you know, wrestling, James Bond. Um, so I think I already stole your answer. That's a good way to ask a question. Answer it for you, then answer the question. Yeah, <laughs> there are. I mean, of course, I love Back to the Future. I love um, professional wrestling. Um, and the, the James Bond project that I've been able to work on with you all has been so rewarding because Bond was another thing. I was like five or six when I discovered it. And it was like a, a VHS tape. My dad had like taped it off the television and I got to watch Diamonds Are Forever. It was the first movie I watched. And then you dive into that series. Indiana Jones is another one that I love. But the fandom that I'm like super deep in, as deep as Bond, as deep as Back to the Future, as deep as pro wrestling, believe it or not, I love Home Alone. I love them all. <laughs> Made for TV ones, nice. the one coming out soon. I'm so excited. Love all right. I'm so excited. I, I think Home Alone 1 is one of the most quotable films of all time. And they knock it out of the park. And uh, so that's another fandom that I'm, I'm real deep on. I didn't expect. Did you expect that one? I didn't expect No, that. I didn't. That, that, that was a left field answer. I thought I stole your answer and you one up me in a big way. <laughs> well, Sean, yeah. you're what the French call les compétents. No, I'm just kidding. That's from Home Alone. It's from Home Alone. <laughs> Calm down, guys. I'm with uh, uh, Brad on things like Indiana Jones. I, I uh, came to Bond a little bit late. I'm a huge Daniel Craig Bond fan, um, uh, but also, uh, I mean, come on, the Nintendo 64 made me a fan of uh, Goldeneye. Uh, yeah, Indian, Indiana Jones. Yeah, pro wrestling. Just, we could have a great conversation. It, it, it is a great, uh, I always call it the greatest uh, form of storytelling out there uh, when you connect with the audience and tell those stories in the ring. And, and it's, it's a big passion of mine, too. Um, I, am, I am huge. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of at times at the same level as my love of Star Wars uh, Game of Throne, Song of Ice and Fire, soon House of the Dragon. I spend a lot of time. I have, I have a podcast called Casterly Talk. I spend a lot of time diving into the themes of those uh, the, that story. Both both versions. I contend uh, you should the show separated from the books thirty seconds into the first episode of season one, and they are telling their two separate stories in the same kind of world. And uh, I love diving into those. Love having discussions about those those book uh, those books, the, the, the shows, the series, and. And doing a big rewatch right now where I'm going through each episode and looking at the themes and how uh, and the lessons and the, the point of every episode and how it connects to the finale and having fun doing that. Star Wars and Game of Thrones could be, you know, I've, I've muted a lot of words on social media to live a peaceful life. Sean. Paul. <laughs> yeah, I got to say for, for me, it's uh, I'm, I'm all about the Warriors. Love the Warriors. <laughs> Got my, my baseball furies too. I, I wish there was more than just one movie to to love, but yeah. boy, is it another is it a one good before one. I forget. 1985, Christopher Lloyd holds a unique distinction of playing both a doctor and a professor in the same year. 1985's Clue is a big. I'm a big fan of Clue the movie. I've I've made a lot of people watch that movie. It's a it, it is a great film. But I wanted to do a that I'm a little worried about now because I thought I'd come up with good questions. I want to do a little mini quiz because I know you guys host them um, oh. a, about about each other's fandom. It's just three real quick questions each. Um, so it's going to be three Star Wars for you, Brad. Three Back to the oh, Future no. for you, Ken. Okay. <laughs> I, I got a feeling you're you're going to nail this, but we're we're going to try it anyway. Start with you uh, with you, Ken. Um, so back to the future. And these, I'm hoping, get a little harder as we go, but we'll see. So first one, name the three main characters with the last name Tannen. Uh, w w Biff. Uh, Biff. Uh, 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 is, it, is it Griff? And then Mad, Mad Dog. 
That's it. Yep. Yep. You got him. Yep. The money. Buford, if you want to be, you know, uh, yeah. specific <laughs> about it. I'm just saying. Brad, what oh, no. planet do Wookiees come from? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, mentioned Star Wars being generational, and as Star Wars continues to grow, and again, if there was just the three movies, similar to what Brad's even saying about the first Back to the Future, if there's just the three movies, people would uh, be rediscovering those movies or discovering them for themselves at, at many at many different times. I would say it's like the Beatles. I'm a big Beatles fan, but I discovered them in 1987. Have you heard about this band called the Beatles? My dad like, <laughs> yeah, I've heard about the Beatles. And I think Star Wars fans, every generation starts to discover it. And that's the challenge for older fans, particularly our generation, the original trilogy fans, is letting go, letting that grip of how we discovered it and how we viewed it and how there's now so many different perspectives and backgrounds and, and upbringings and identities that now can discover Star Wars and it becomes their on, theirs on their own. So that, that's how I think a lot of people get to Star Wars. And no matter what age, what I hope they get from it is, is what is at the core of Star Wars is this lesson of choices, but also this ongoing battle between hope and fear and how that can lead you through life in so many ways. Star Wars can be broken down and applied to your choices at lunch today or going into the second grade or the big problem you got at work or relationships. Hope versus fear is the heart of Star Wars and it's at, in every corner and every, of every lesson of every movie and every story. And, and that's what I hope people take away from it. But also, hey, pretty cool, cool lightsabers and pew, pew, pew. Right. You make a good point about the like pe people coming at it differently than the younger generation, because I've, I've talked to kids about Star Wars and they're like, oh, yeah, like I really like Padme and Anakin. And I it takes me a second to think like, oh, yeah, that's also like that would be the first ones they saw. They started at episode one. And so they relate Star Wars primarily. That's yeah. That's to me. Padme and yeah. Anakin. And then the when other I, when I was a kid, on. when I was a kid, there was nothing cooler. You were in elementary school because, I mean, um, when Phantom Menace came out, that was 99, and I was in, I don't know, first or second grade, something like that. But there was nothing cooler than they had these markers that had the characters' heads on top of the markers, mm -hmm. and there was a Jar Jar Binks marker. And if you had the Jar Jar Binks with the little head on it, you were like the cat's pajamas at school. And it's funny when you grow up all these years later and you realize how controversial of a character he is within the universe, right? But for mm -hmm. me, Jar Jar Binks, amazing. Phantom Menace, Pod Racist, it's the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. And I think, Ken, you and I might have talked about this when we were in Brooklyn together, but I actually enjoy this most recent sequel trilogy as a, as a movie cinema watcher more than the, the, the two trilogies prior. And I know that might be controversial uh, to say as a Star Wars fan. I just find them to be so much fun to watch. And I think that is what's cool about the Star Wars, uh, three Star Wars trilogies. They're a saga told in three movies each like three part three movies but they're all done so differently the prequel trilogy is really different from the original trilogy as far as pace timing action dialogue the performances and the sequel trilogy is almost this marvel universe uh, version of star wars and it's it's very much more enjoyable for like the average popcorn viewer my mother her first movie of Star Wars she ever saw was Last Jedi in theaters. And she mm -hmm. walked out and was like, I have no idea what any of that was about, but I enjoyed it. What are these ice dogs? Why was you know, Luke's hair shorter at one point in the movie? I, I don't know what's going on, but I like it. I think that's some powerful stuff you're saying. I, I, I am a, a person who absolutely adores the, the prequel trilogy, number one, and think there's so much in it, and it's way deeper than people ever uh, from my generation want to give it credit for. I, I just did a two-hour podcast recently on Dexter's Diner being the actual, mm -hmm. one of the most important scenes in the prequel trilogy. It's George Lucas's thesis statement on the Jedi and the fall of the Jedi and how it was happening. But it's in a scene that people make fun of, and it's a 50s diner, and no one gets that George is saying this is a place of comfort. This is a place uh, of, of, of knowledge versus wisdom. And it is this deep conversation. George put so much in there, but it said, hey, I'm doing this different. And I did reject it at first, too. In 1999, I had, so, I had some issues and all those kind of things. And, and my seven-year-old uh, uh, cousin at the time, now he's, he's obviously a little older, he was like, man, Phantom Menace, right? So good. And I just remember thinking, because I, I was doing the, but, 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 and I was like, yeah, yeah, you're right. 
You're right, because that's the story there. The sequel trilogy, I love the stuff. I, I could go on and on about Rise of Skywalker being the most spiritual of Star Wars films. It's like going to Star Wars Church for me. Uh, it connects beautifully to the eight previous films because of the emotional core, the connection, that hope versus fear. It's the core of Star Wars. Um, but I love them. It doesn't mean you can't go around and find, eh, this, this didn't work, this didn't work for me. Of course, of course. But if you're a Star Wars fan, if you're plugged in, if you're a Back to the Future fan, you're plugged in. You know, Back to the Future, you won't have the debate. Is three better than two? Is two better than hey, – you can have those debates. Those are fun. Me and Brad in a bar in Brooklyn can do that all night. So it's not Mustafar. I know that. It's not Tatooine, I don't think. I'll, I'll give you a hint. It's spelled with, I believe, three Ys. What is it? I have no it's, idea. Okay, chic. Oh, Brad! Isn't that like a letter in the Russian alphabet or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 the backwards K. It's called yeah, the okay. <laughs> All right, Ken. What is the name of the mall at the end at the end of the first Back to the Future movie? Uh, the Lone Pine Mall, right? Lone Pine Mall, yeah, because Marty runs over the tree. Yeah. When you're a kid and you figure that out for the first time, it's the greatest day. It's a mind. It, yeah, yeah, you feel like mind. a genius. All right, Brad. Which character loses a hand? in Star Wars A New Hope. First character to lose the hand. Oh, crap. You're good. Is it? Oh, uh, I don't know. Obi-Wan? It's not. It's, it's Ponda Baba. In see, the, I see in the I'm cantina. not deep in the Star Wars. But, but, right. but Obi-Wan takes, is the one that takes the arm off. So you have yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. I, I was half, halfway there. A, I was a halfway solid there. half of a point. Uh, Ken, your last one. What does Doc put in his suitcase in case they don't have any of them in the future? Oh my God, is uh, is it a, a is it batteries? No, I don't know. It's, it's cotton underpants. Yeah, cotton Fill, underwear. He fills it up with cotton underwear. All right, Brad, last one, and I'll tell you this ties into wrestling because this guy wrote for wrestling briefly. What '90s heartthrob? is the voice of Kanan in Star Wars Rebels. He also was a writer for oh, WWE. Oh, I know this one. Freddie Prince Jr. Freddie Prince Jr. Thanks, th th thanks for playing that. I just I know you guys do the quiz, and I thought it'd be fun. Do a little no. back and forth. Fine, just uh, talk briefly about, about each of your books, and I know you got it there, too, so if you don't mind holding it up. Hey, you got why we love Star Wars, the greatest, uh, the, the, the great moments that built the galaxy far, far away. It's 100 stories, 100 essays of uh, my favorite scenes in Star Wars, my, uh, which include some of the shows, some of the books released in 2019. So things like Mandalorian, Rise of Skywalker, not there, at least not there yet. But it is uh, 100 stories of uh, my favorite moments and how I relate to them and hopefully how you connect with them and how we find in those moments the reasons we love Star Wars, big and small, from something as small of the, as the sound of the seismic charges from uh, Jango Fett and Boba Fett's ship all the way up into to Luke Skywalker uh, throwing down his lightsaber and using compassion and empathy to help save the day. A big lesson in Star Wars. My book, Back from the Future, a celebration of the greatest time travel story ever told. This is the hardcover. Also, Sean, I know you like this. This is the audio CD, right? Nice. From, this is the audio CD if you want to get that. It's a fan's perspective of why we love Back to the Future and why I believe it's the greatest cinematic time travel story ever told. We look at the history of the films. I have essays about deleted scenes in the films, talk about what happened on the actual future day back in 2015, and as well have an almanac filled with all kinds of fun trivia and facts that the layman Back to the Future fan does not know. Thank you both so much for having this chat. This has been incredible fun for me. I, I honestly really like both of these books, so. Uh, Let me actually say one more thing it. real quick. December 2nd, not sure when this stairs, but December 2nd, the paperback version of Back from the Future is out with a brand new chapter featuring interviews with cast, uh, cast from uh, the film. So you check that out. You know, Crispin Glover is one of those, which I am mm -hmm. very keen to read. You, you can pick that up everywhere. Anyone watching this, both of these books, um, you, you can buy them wherever books are sold. Mm -hmm.